As I'm recording this, it is the end of July, 2021. And right now in Tokyo, the Summer Olympics are happening. Now the Olympics were a little bit different this year. They were actually supposed to happen last year in 2020, but because of the pandemic, they were postponed and they're happening right now as I'm recording. The reason that's important is because today my guest is a former Olympic gold medalist. Today I interviewed Laura Wilkinson. She won the gold medal in the 2000 Summer Olympics for platform diving. And if any of you were around and watched it, you'll remember it because it was one of the biggest comebacks in U.S. Olympic history. Laura talks about that moment. She talked about what it took to get to that moment and what that moment meant to her in our interview. So I'll let her share some of that. But I'd like to tell you a little bit more about her in introduction because certainly that was not the only time she won a medal. I'm gonna read so I don't miss anything, but Laura was also the 2004 World Cup champion and she won the gold in the 2005 World Championships as well. That actually made her the first woman in US history to win three coveted world titles in platform diving. Pretty impressive. She also, along the way, picked up 19 US national titles. She was nominated for an SB award. She won the 2000 US Olympic Spirit Award, and she has been inducted into five halls of fame, including the International Swimming Hall of Fame. So she is clearly quite an accomplished athlete, but she is also a mom of four young children and a recent best-selling author of the book, Life at 10 Meters, Lessons from an Olympic Champion. We're gonna talk about all of that in our conversation. So I hope you will sit back and listen in as Laura Wilkinson shares her story. Hi, Laura, welcome to It Just Takes One. Great to have you today. Thanks for having me, Kelly. I'm excited to talk. I am as well. I'm really excited to share your book and your story and some of the great things that you have going on. And I want to start by sharing just a really beautiful moment that you shared with me along the way. One of the things for the listeners and the viewers, uh, one of the things that I love the most is when our authors actually hold their book in their hand for the first time, because we've worked on it. It's been sitting there. It's been waiting. There's this sort of build up to it. And then there's the moment when it comes in the mail and you open it and it's actually a thing. And Laura, you sent me a video of that moment. Can you share what that was like and what happened in the moment when you actually held it for the first time? Well, I mean, it's cool. I was proud we finally got it done and it was gonna become real, but there is something different when you hold it in your hand and it's like this actual thing. And it was it was really cool. My, my kids rarely let me open a package by myself and they all took a copy like right away. And my 10 year old started reading it. I mean, like absorbed in it and was just so excited. And I didn't expect that. I mean, I expected she'd probably read it, but I didn't think she would be so fascinated by it because there were stories in there, I guess I've never told her or she didn't remember. And she was really just, she was telling me all her favorite parts throughout it. And, and at 10 years old, that she could recognize a lot of the things going on and um, a lot of the pain I was in and how I overcame. I, that just really kind of, I don't know, it struck me. It was really cool. And so now I'm like, okay, moms, like buy this and read it with your children and talk together about how you face challenges, how you overcome challenges. I, I just think it's going to be really neat that way for, for parents to bond with their kids. Did you expect that when you were writing it? Did you ever have this anticipation that it might actually be this great thing that you could share with your kids and, and, and create an opportunity for parents? No, not really. I mean, I kind of just wanted to share some of the like lessons that I learned on the way. It's not like a big autobiography, but I just wanted to share some of the things that I've learned because I feel like diving has taught me a lot. And, and it was fun to write because I started writing it when I was actually getting back into diving after a nine year break. And so it was really cool. Like I, I talked about a mental block I had on this one dive that I was terrified to learn as I was relearning it for the first time in, in actually like 11 years, I think I had done that one. So it was really neat to, to go through that process, getting back into it. So I, I didn't really expect much on the other side. I just kind of wanted to get my story out there. Interesting. So there was sort of this cathartic experience happening at the same time as you were writing and, and experiencing it live at the same moment. Yeah, definitely. Didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I actually hear that a lot with authors that 
the writing process itself is is such this I think there's something about getting it outside of your head <laughs> that mm -hmm. makes it cathartic but it also makes it manageable that you can actually do something with it instead of just having it spin around in here in fear yeah for sure well and as you start putting the story on paper or you start like telling people about the story that you're writing and then you start remembering things that you completely forgot about you know so that, I think that's part of the fun too is like you're digging way back into your brain and you're pulling stuff out that like you haven't thought about in so many years it's cool yeah it is really cool so what about your daughter so she read through it and there were some stories in there that she didn't know before was there anything that really stood out to her well, she thought it was very funny um, at the beginning that one of my childhood friends and I used to wait for cars to pass by and we would perform gymnastics in the front yard, like showing off for whoever <laughs> would come by. So she thought that was hilarious that I did something like that. Um, and she thought it was really, she, I mean, I think she knew I dove with a broken foot, but I don't think she realized the gravity of it until she read the story. Um, and about how I had to pretend to dive for such a long period of time. She thought that was pretty neat. And that she just kept saying, you never gave up, like you never gave up. And she was really impressed with that, you know? And so we've had some really good conversations since then about that. Wow. That's really pretty deep. Actually. It's, that's a great takeaway for her. You know, I think as parents, we tend to, we forget that the kids just see this one side of us. They don't, they might know the story, but they don't really know the backstory. They don't know all the other things that we go through. And it, it maybe gives this opportunity for the, for her to see you as just as all these other sides of you. Yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. And I mean, like she's seen the videos of me winning, but she doesn't know like what was happening in each round. She doesn't know, you know, the magnitude, I guess, of what was going on. Um, and so reading that, and now we're watching the Olympics on TV, she's really kind of starting to put a few things together, which is cool to see and hear her ask like neat questions. Oh yeah, the timing, perfect. <laughs> perfect for her to see that. And all your kids, because she's, she's 10 and your other three are how old? Uh, nine, seven, and five. So a busy mom, uh, lots of things going on. I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was preparing for this was just this idea of, all these busy moms that are out there that are, you know, taking care of their kids. We were just talking moments ago about summer, summer schedules and camps and shuttling the kids everywhere. I feel like I've been having that conversation with a lot of moms recently. Uh, and, and you added, in addition to all of that, this training for the Olympics this year. Well, actually, you started this a while back um, because we thought we were going to be doing the Olympics last year. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about how, how do you fold in high performance athletics training, all that's required, because that's a full-time job in itself, and a mom of four kids, and running a business, and writing a book. What's your secret? How do you do it all? <laughs> I have a really amazing husband, so he definitely helps a lot. We kind of have a weird schedule where, um, and we homeschooled the kids this year too, with all the COVID craziness, we wanted to give them some stability, so we kept them home. And he kind of, like, I helped pick out the curriculum, I got the room set up, but he kind of led the teaching on that um, every day, because he would do that first thing in the morning when I would go to training. Then I would come back after training, we'd high five, he'd go to coach, he's a swim coach, um, and I'd stay home with kids in the afternoon and do whatever activities. So there was a lot of juggling. I, I feel like logistics becomes the biggest factor. You know, you're trying to get a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, sometimes late nights, which is hard because I, as an older athlete, need to prioritize recovery and I'm really not good at that. So I'm trying to get better at that. Um, but yeah, it's really, there's a lot of juggling and some days you just, you drop a couple of the balls and it stinks and it's disappointing, but you can pick them back up and you can start again and you try your best the next day. And you just got to realize that you're not going to be perfect. Like you are going to fall. Sometimes you're going to mess up. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the road. It doesn't mean you need to quit. You need to pick them back up, dust yourself off, learn from it and keep going. So that's kind of what I've learned. It's like this, you know, it's this marathon. It's not a sprint for sure. Mm, it makes sense. And actually the way that you're saying that makes me think that, you know, a coach could probably be saying that it's a lot of what you learned as an athlete about, you know, not every dive is perfect. Not every landing works, not every twist is there, um, but you've got to pick yourself back up and, and get back on and do it again. So let's, let's literally and figuratively dive into that a little bit, because I, I think it's always fascinating to see people that are at the top of their sport and 
so much of what gets people there, and I know what got you there, is mindset. And you talk about mindset in, in the book a little bit. Um, I, I actually, I'll, I'll share one piece. I'll read this to you. This is right at the, at the start of the book. Um, you actually say this about mindset. Throughout my journey, I was seeking my life purpose, both personally and as an athlete. I have learned what drives me to jump out of bed each morning, jump into frigid water, and emerge with the biggest smile on my face. With a grin, I invite you to follow my personal and athletic quest for Olympic gold. <laughs> so what's the secret? What, how do you get the mindset to, to jump out of bed every morning, to jump into the frigid water, to, to get back up when it doesn't go well? What, what do you know? What can you share about developing that kind of mindset? I think it's knowing why you're doing it. Um, what's the reason behind it? Because you can have big goals, but like they're going to be hard days. There's going to be days you don't feel like getting out of bed. You, you're everything's going wrong, and you have no reason to want to get up. Like you need a reason to keep you going when things are hard, when things are tough. What's going to get you out when you're tired, when you're cold, when you're you just don't want to do it anymore? Like they're just days. I'm the most motivated person in the world. There are days they're going to want to quit. And so, what's going to keep you going? Um, in the midst of that. And I think that's important for sports, for your job, for your family, for all of those things. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's really having that why, and, and if you need to tape it on your mirror, you need a reminder somewhere where you can see it day in and day out multiple times a day to remember that, like, this is why, this is why I'm doing that. It helps you dig deep. It helps you keep going. Yeah. And what's your why? Why, why, why do you, Put yourself through all of that training and all of that effort and, and keep striving for those goals. What's your why? Well, I mean, when it comes to diving, it's, it, it ebbs and flows. And I, I feel like there's more than one reason, but ultimately I just feel like I was called to do it. Um, it's something I feel like I was made for and I absolutely love. And I mean, even when I retired at the age of 30, it wasn't because I didn't want to dive. I was ready to start a family. Um, and so it was always in the back of my mind, you know, it's just something that I absolutely love doing. And even if, you know, when I came back, I kept saying like, I'd love to do these things, but even if I don't get to compete again, like I just love doing my dives again. And what a special gift that's been, because usually people at my ripe old age don't get to do that high level trick again. They don't get to do that thing at this level. And, and so to get to do that again, has been a real treat for me. And I, I just passionately love it. You know, and I, I do aim big, I'm very competitive and I, I like to dream big in that way. And when it comes to my kids, you know, I want to be the best one we can be because I want to raise them to be these awesome individuals that can really shine a light, you know, bright in this world. And I also have to recognize when, when I'm falling short and when I mess up around them, um, to, to ask for forgiveness. Like when I screw up, when I yell at them and I realize that, okay, that was so uncalled for. I'll just pull over. Hey, I'm so sorry. Mommy overreacted. I was wrong. I didn't realize this. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? And, and offer them grace sometimes when they don't deserve it. You know, having those moments where maybe they deserve a consequence or a punishment, but, but offering them grace instead, because that's what God has shown us. And like remembering those qualities, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of, what motivates me. It really just, I guess it all just comes from the Lord. I feel called to do this. I want to resemble him in the way I'm raising my kids and who I want them to be. So yeah, I guess it all comes back to that, you know, and in every, every action that we have, we have a choice. Um, and sometimes we get caught up in things, but to be able to step back in the moment and realize that I have a choice in how I handle this. I, I don't need to just react. I can choose to respond. And I think that's really really important and something I strive to, and I don't always achieve. Like I said, I drop the ball. I, I fail daily, but to recognize when I do fail so that next time I get in that situation, I can hopefully make a better choice. Yeah, absolutely. And it's back to that whole mindset thing, right? You know, so we're not always perfect. And I'm not sure the goal is always to be perfect. It's to learn how to handle when things are not and, you know, making those choices, learning how to make those choices. I, I, I I was listening to that and I was thinking, you know, you, you feel this calling, obviously you, you, you're, you're great and you have a gift for diving, but you didn't always know that you didn't just, you know, suddenly wake up one day and, oh, diving is your thing. There's actually a great story, which you write about, about how you got into diving and it came about, which I think is a really good talking point. It came about from a naysayer. It came about from somebody who said you couldn't, and I'm going to share that little bit of, of that in the book here on page 17, you talked about the moment that you went back to your, you were on a drill team 
-hmm. And you went back to the drill team instructor to tell her that you were going to try out for the junior Olympic diving team. She was visibly angry and proceeded to tell me you are too old to start something new. Interestingly, I had only joined the drill team less than a year ago and she was fighting for me to stay on the team. I guess I was that good. But I thought, how can I be too old to start something new? I had just started on that drill team and my instructor was leading me to believe that I had excelled at it. I was surprised by her words. She didn't try to talk me into staying. Instead, she just slammed my choice. <laughs> and suddenly- Yeah, I feel like that's kind of the story of my life, people telling me no, and I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> so yeah, it's, I, I mean, I'm very much one of those people. If you tell me I can't do it, I'm going to either die trying or I'm going to figure out a way to do it. <laughs> no, that's just the way I'm wired. And I'm, I'm thankful for that, you know, because it, it can be a really good fuel because just a year later, I was kicked off my high school diving team, told I was a waste of space. Um, and, you know, I'm very thankful that I had a club coach who, was able to tell me, look, no, it, you've got big dreams. I think you can achieve them. You just need to, to stick with me and, and be in here and I can, I can guide you the rest of the way. So yeah, I think that's a big, a big deal to have somebody cheering in your corner. But um, yeah, when people tell you, no, people are always going to tell you, no, like we're, you're never going to please the entire world. We, we want people to like us. We want people to believe in us, but it's just not reality. It's just not real. Like a lot of people are going to doubt you or they're going to be scared of you doing something great. And so they're going to come across, you know, negative to you. So the, the end of the day, like if you have a big dream or a big goal, like chase it, if you fail, like fail going all out because you're still going to get a lot farther than if you'd never tried at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the biggest motivator is like you said, somebody telling you no, and you're going, oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? Let me show you. Um, you also write about your high school coach and how you were kicked off that team. I was curious, though, did you ever get a chance to go back and talk to that person? I'm just wondering how that worked out when, when they saw how far you he went. He was actually let go from his job a few years later. So no. And I, I, I don't think I would have. I'm not the type of person to go back and like, you know, actually rub it in his face, just kind of held on to that for myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that maybe there was a, a moment where he would have reached out to you and said, wow, did I make a big mistake? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't think he cared that much. <laughs> the other part of it is truthfully, if you had stayed on the high school team, it's possible you wouldn't have ended up putting in the time over at the club team, which might have meant that you didn't continue in the way that you did. Right. That's true. And, you know, it also makes me think too, because both of those things, my drill team and my high school diving coach, they came from coaches, from teachers, from people in authority positions. And I don't think like my, that high school coach probably doesn't even remember what he did to me and, and the effect that it had on me, but it affected me drastically, fortunately in a good way. But how many times are our kids getting told the same thing? And the kids, instead of like fighting back, are crumbling and their entire self-esteem is disintegrated and they think they're worthless. And, you know, I, so it just makes me really conscious of like what I'm saying to the people around me, because sometimes, you know, you'll just say stuff and you don't always think about how it impacts those around you. So especially when I'm around like my little teammates at, at practice, I try to think about what I'm saying, like make sure it's, it's, you know, constructive and it's encouraging and it's not just, you know, negative Nancy or complaining about other people. You know, I try to make sure I'm wise with my words. I'm not always, again, I, I mess up sometimes, but I, I really try to be cognizant of that. Yeah, I, you actually speak to that um, as well in the book. You you had the naysayers, which motivate in one way, but you also had many, many supporters. And you speak specifically about Kenny, who was another diver who was really supportive of you and 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 really helped and coached you along the way. And, and you, you write in here, Kenny was an Olympic diver and was coaching world-class athletes. It seemed like my dream was possible with him. He believed I had the skill to win the gold and I paid attention. From that point on, my belief that I was a winning diver became entrenched. These trials of people telling me that I wasn't enough, wasn't the right age or whatever, these naysayers made me focus on working even harder toward my vision. Words do matter. A person's life will change, good or bad, based on words that are spoken. With our words, someone's fire can either be put out or ignited. Yeah. I mean, definitely like that's when Kenny pulled me aside and I remember him asking me one day, he said, what's your dream? Like, what do you want to do in this sport? 
And I was really embarrassed to say that I wanted to go to the Olympics because I thought, well, who am I? I just started. I'm not good enough. Like, who am I to say that? But it, that's really what my, my dream was, my goal was. And so I just took a risk and I blurted it out and he didn't laugh. He didn't say no. He just thought about it and said, okay, well, if that's what you need to do, like, it's going to be hard, but these are the things we need to start working on now. And this is where we need to, and he just suddenly came up with this plan and it was like, Oh, what? Like he thinks this could really happen. Like, <laughs> okay, wait, that you're so you're saying this is possible. And I think the fact that he believed in me and he was someone who I knew, knew how to do it. Like there, there was kind of that double whammy there. And I think, um, that really made all the difference for me, just that one person believing in me, um, and, you know, being willing to being willing to lead me there. Yeah. Yeah. I've often said that, you know, it takes one person to believe in you just takes one person, but you also have to have the spark inside yourself, right? If, if you don't believe it yourself, it doesn't matter who believes it. If you, but if you've got that little seed in there and someone fosters it, just blows a little bit of oxygen to it and believes in you, it's, a, it's incredible what you can accomplish. Oh, definitely. 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about where, <laughs> what you accomplished because of that. So, you know, oh, I think I might want to go to Olympics it actually became that and more. Um, let's talk about the 2000 Olympics, your first Olympic debut. Um, share a little bit about that was a, a pretty astounding. Obviously, you ended up with gold, uh, but it didn't come without a battle and it didn't come without some challenge. So feel free to share that story. Well, there, there were a lot of battles <laughs> that year. I mean, just just to get to the Olympic games themselves, I had broken my foot in three places um, just a couple of months before the Olympic trials. And I only had about two and a half weeks in the water um, before I got to trials. And so we had to really think outside the box and, and kind of do this whole mental training that we'd never done before. And I really think that ended up making the biggest difference for me at the Olympic games, because some crazy stuff happened in the middle of the Olympic final that I would not have been prepared for had I not broken my foot. So I've, I've told a lot of people, I was one of our best platform divers. Like I had a good shot at making the team as things were. And I, I feel like I probably could have made the team if I hadn't broken my foot, but I can almost guarantee you, I would not have stood on top of the podium without breaking my foot. I think it was the biggest blessing for me because it forced me to do something I never really worked on, at least not to that extent. And that made me so much uh, mentally stronger and emotionally stronger going into that Olympic games. Cause all kinds of things happen. Um, in the third round, like I had, batteries to my headphones died you know an athlete it's like we love our music we got to get in that zone we always talk about the athlete zone which is like that perfect mix of excitement and nerves but being able to control it and not letting it kind of carry you away um and so I went to put my headphones on in the third of five rounds and my batteries died this is back in the day of the, the ancient Walkmans you know where you put the cassette tape in you couldn't just charge your phone in the wall and like make it work all of a sudden so you know that was kind of this big moment of oh what do I do if I can't have my music and I can't get in my zone but it forced me into this place of um, remembering what I had done in the past and knowing that I could do this and giving myself this pep talk that actually made me more confident going into this dive than I think I would have been otherwise. And when I hit that dive, the entire contest changed. All the top four people that were going after me missed their dives and I jumped from fifth to first place. I didn't know that, but I knew I had a like fighting chance at this point. And, um, you know, going into the second to last round, it was a dive I'd struggled with. It was the one I broke my foot on. And I remember I still didn't have batteries in my headphones, so I still had no music. So I'm like running over to my coach, hoping he's going to have some magical words for me. And he tells me to do it for my friend Hillary. And he walks away. And we, we had lost Hillary. She's one of my teammates. We'd lost her in a car accident three years before. And, um, you know, I was just trying to figure out why my coach is trying to make me cry in the middle of the most important moment of my life. <laughs> and, but it, it forced me to this place because I trusted him because of what we had been through. And I knew for some reason I needed to go there and to think about her. And I wasn't scared because I had done so many things outside the box. I was willing to trust him with that. And so I thought about her walking up that platform and it made me realize that this was a dream I had had since I was a little girl, but I wasn't the only one with this dream. She had had this dream. All these teammates that had supported me to get there had had this dream. And when I got up to that 10 meter, it wasn't about me or being scared or worrying about getting hurt again. Like I, I was able to just let that go because I was like, this is it. I have nothing else to hold back for. I have nothing else to save myself for. I have to be all in because it's not even just about me anymore. And 
that ended up, I think, being the dive that really solidified the gold medal for me um, because I hit it and stayed in the lead. And that was the real risky one for me. That was the real iffy one. And I think that was really the biggest game changer. So breaking my foot and everything we went to up to that point really made that possible. Yeah, amazing how the biggest challenges can create the biggest success, right? Something that you think is going to be the end and ends up becoming such a, a huge win. Yeah, I was actually just watching, um, I can't remember, you'll probably remember the um, swimmer, was it last night, who had a rip in his suit and had to go back and change the suit right before the race? I missed that part. Yeah, and I'm not remembering the name. I was just watching it this morning as a recap, and and he did great, but he didn't do as well. I, you know, I think he finished first, but he didn't get the time he wanted or something, and he was saying it was that rhythm, his whole rhythm set up before the race was completely thrown off because he had to go back in and change. And so when you're speaking about the batteries going in the headset, you get your routine, right? You have your routine and your ritual and, and you have practiced that over and over and over. So it's so ingrained that it, if you haven't been in a high high performance sport or in, a, in an, op, an opportunity to train like that, you might not understand how important that routine is and that when it gets thrown off, anything can happen. You know, it just kind of gets into your head, right? Mm -hmm, definitely. And, and I think there's a really important distinction between routine and rituals um, because if you're someone who's really ritualistic, especially at the Olympics or anything can happen, somebody's going to mess up that ritual. And that's going to take you out mentally. Cause if you think you have to do that ritual to perform a certain way, if that ritual gets messed up in any way, shape or form, even by somebody else, you've already taken yourself out of the game. So I think it's important to have a routine, to have a structure, um, but that can ebb and flow with changes. I think that's just a really important distinction I like to make to people because people get sucked into being really kind of superstitious and ritualistic and that can completely take you out. Mm, so good. And I think maybe even outside of sport, that's probably a, a good distinction to make that routines can ebb and flow, but they have a rhythm to them versus right. a ritual where it might be too, too rigid. And, right. and if it doesn't work well, then everything topples. And exactly. that's probably a good, a good distinction for life. You know, I'm thinking the other piece of the story as you were just sharing it, um, and, and you share more in the book as well, is what it was like. So the, the mental component of, of dealing with a broken foot forced you to train in a way that you had never trained before. Talk a little bit about that visualization training that you were doing and, and, and how that worked, how you did it. And I'm thinking of it just in terms of listeners and readers that, you know, this can, it might be something to think about in life that you can actually use visualization to achieve your goals. But, but show, talk a little bit about how that worked. Yeah. And I mean, it was kind of a new thing back then. I mean, I'd heard of a couple of divers and I'd actually seen a couple of like Russian divers do it before um, where they wouldn't even warm up. They would just sit in the shower, like with their eyes closed. And I was like, what are they doing? And then they would compete phenomenally. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on there? So I'd kind of seen people do it, but it wasn't this like normal thing that people did. And so when Kenny was talking about, think, my coach Kenny was thinking about thinking outside the box during that time when I had the cast on, we did a lot of video study, first of all, like we took the best dives that I had done either competition or in practice that I had on videotape. And we put them in the order that I was going to compete them. And I would watch them over and over again. I would, I would put on my favorite, you know, inspirational sports songs that I love listening to while I watch them. So anytime I listen to that music, it was almost like the dives would come on instant replay in my brain. Like I watched them that much and I studied it that much, or um, also studied people who were doing the dives that I wanted to do, but they were better than, you know, watching their technique, watching their actions and just in grading them in my mind. And when I was supposed to be in the water training, um, Kenny would take my crutches and I would hop up all the way up the ladder to 10 meter on my good foot and kind of shimmy my way out to the end. And I would go through all the actions of my dive while standing on my foot. And he would coach me from the pool deck. And I would put myself in all different scenarios. You know, it was a practice, it was a competition, you know, I was doing well, I was doing bad, like all these different things um, and preparing because I knew who my competitors were. I knew their strengths, I knew their weaknesses. So I I had a lot of time. So I put myself in a lot of different scenarios. So again, when I got into the meets, I kind of felt ready for anything. Um, and then there were also times where I would sit on the side of the pool deck and I would just stare up at the platform 
and imagine myself doing things from like third person. Like I was watching a video and let me tell you, that is hard. That is really, really hard. The first time I tried to visualize, visualize myself doing such a simple dive, I kept smacking, like landing on my face. I couldn't make myself in my head, do it right. I had to slow it down, like freeze frame, like frame by frame until I finally went in vertical. It took so much practice. Um, but you know, and people trying to add some of this into their workouts, I think is great. I was forced in a place where I was doing this six to eight hours a day, you know, where you're normally training that much, then you're trying to do other things on top of it. So that's why it was such a unique and great situation. Um, but we were doing all of those different aspects of it. So I was fully consumed fully in and in every way. Um, and, and, you know, there was a point where I was up on 10 meter doing my pretend dives. And I, I really felt like, how was pretending to dive going to get me to the Olympics? You know, and I started to feel really stupid and I just really wanted to quit. There was a time that I really wanted to quit. The swimmers in the pool next to us were making fun of me and my teammates who were only like eight to 18 years old, they were coming up. I guess they just recognized it. were giving me hugs saying, Hey, I believe in you. You can do this, you know, don't give up. And they, they would get to the point where I would do like a pretend entry on the 10 meter and they'd be on the other side of the pool going, I didn't see a drop of water. I'd give it a 10. And they started <laughs> cheering for me. And I'm sure it looked completely insane to anybody watching, but it made all the difference in the world to me because I didn't feel like I was alone anymore. Mm -hmm. I knew that I had these people behind me and I knew it wasn't just about me anymore. And those are those are the moments that I thought about when I was up there before that hard dive, realizing that it wasn't about me. I was remembering all those kids that like, you know what, I'm probably their only shot at an Olympic gold medal. You know, they may not never, ever get to this point to try. And so it, it was so much more than just me. And I just love how God can use anyone in your life. Like no matter how old you are, no matter what station in life you are, you can really make a difference to somebody else. And it doesn't always take a lot. You just got to be there for them. Oh, it's so, so, so true. And I'm always fascinated by the, the mind body connection too. And you're up there visualizing in your own little dream world of, of your, of your dives. And suddenly you had them visualizing it too. So it was so contagious that suddenly everybody was in the visualization, which is really kind of cool when you think about it. It was, um, it was really fun. It was really yeah. fun. I mean, I, I know there are studies out there that say that yeah, I think they did studies on people that actually physically did a workout and then people that were just sitting there imagining they were doing a workout and they got like 70% of the benefit of the workout without ever leaving their chair. So we used to tease people, well, all you need to do is sit in your chair and visualize, you'll be good. Um, <laughs> but, but the power of getting so clear in the vision of what needs to happen does matter. It does matter because look at what happened with you. You know, you, you, how many, how many weeks did you have to actually do the dives before you were doing them at the Olympics? Once well, I only, I only had two and a half weeks between when I got my cast off and I got to dive in the Olympic trials. So that was like no time. So, and then we had another three months until the Olympics from that point, but my foot was still broken. Like it was still, Cause they didn't do surgery on it. Like they should have. I had a bone that was actually lodged underneath. Cause I broke the middle three bones. So one bone stayed lodged underneath. And so I couldn't walk up the platform unless I had a shoe on and I had to show, throw the shoe down from 10 meter and stuff. So there was still a lot of visualization going on because I couldn't do the numbers um, like I was before. Yeah. Yeah. And so the visualization is what did it, you know, you, because you could see it, you actually achieved it. It's such a powerful lesson for all of us, not, any of us that are not going to be up on a 10 meter diving board, it's for anybody, right? If you can see it, if you can get that clear and you can live it in the visualization. You can make it happen. Like writing a book. If you, if you mm -hmm. can see yourself holding it in your hand, you can actually get there. It's possible. Definitely. So all of that, you know, the, obviously it was a huge comeback and, and people, I hope if you haven't seen those dives, you go, you can see the videos of them. They're, they're online and you can see her winning that, um, that moment. Um, there was a moment, actually, I think you say it was your favorite Olympic moment um, that I, I would love to share uh, as, as you wrote it here in the book. On page 46, you said, one of my most favorite moments of the Olympics was right before my last dive. I was waiting on the 10 meter for my name to be called, waiting for the TV stuff to finish. The crowd was really loud. Throughout the games, I had become the crowd favorite and they were now rooting for me to dive. I soaked it in. How many people get to come so close to achieving their dreams? 
I didn't know what was about to happen, whether I'd be first or fifth. All I knew is that, that this moment was so sweet. I was living out my dream that so few people get to do. I remember where everyone was in the arena, where my coach was sitting, my teammates and my family. I could even hear my brother screaming over the 17,000 cheering people. It was such an incredible moment. Then I dove. It was, I have like a panoramic picture in my head of that moment um, because you did, I mean, maybe all my dreams were about to come true. Maybe they weren't, but in that moment, I was in the moment, you know what I mean? And I just, I realized that like, this is the moment we live for is to be in the hunt for that medal, to be living it out. And so I remember where Kenny was sitting. I remember where my teammates were, where my family was, what the arena looked like. It was like, there was almost a spotlight on the pool and everything else seemed dark. And I just remember that feeling like that was a dive I knew was going to be good. I just didn't know if it would be good enough. And it was just this really, really cool moment. And I remember looking at the ref, he nodded to me. I nodded back to him. He blew the whistle and I walked out there and went. And um, it wasn't a great dive. <laughs> it was solid, but um, it was just a real experience. It was really fun because like I had to wait for the last four girls to go after that too. And I couldn't see the scoreboard from where they made a stand but I could see my coach and he could see the scoreboard. So after each one of them would go, he would turn around and be like, yes, you know, and pumping his fist. I'm like, all right, like, what does that mean? I guess we're in the medals. Like, I didn't know that meant I was in first. And after the last girl went, I mean, she hit the water. She was way past vertical. He came running over and picked me up. And I was like, what place did we get? You know, and he kept going, we did it. We did it. And it took me a few minutes to realize oh, like we did it. Like we didn't just medal, like we won, you know, I just didn't even recognize what he was saying. It was, it was really cool that he's the one that got to tell me. Yeah, really, really, really cool. I've been thinking a lot about that, you know, even as I was just reading that and thinking about that you had those 17,000 people and you had the, your family and your coach, everybody was right there. And this year they don't, you know, this year I've been looking at those empty stands and feeling so much for those athletes you know, they're kind of showing their families at home. Um, but I, I, have you talked to anybody? Do, I mean, what, what's your thought on how that changes the competition as they're in Tokyo right now? I think it changes a lot. And um, honestly, I feel really bad for Olympians who this might be their only Olympics or their first Olympics. It's not the Olympic experience. And so that makes me really sad for them because that's part of what the Olympics is, is the excitement and the crowds and the feeling that's in there, the buzz, you know, it's, it's not the same without that. However, I mean, some athletes are obviously still rising up and they're doing amazing and it's so cool. Um, but I, I do feel bad because there's just that, that specialness that having everybody there watching you and cheering you on and your family being right there. I mean, that's a really tough boat. And so, you know, that's been, that's been hard to watch. And I know it's really affecting some athletes. I think it's affecting some of the judging. I think um, there's a subconscious thing that when people are cheering really loud, it plays into the judges scores. And I, I think that's just a reality they can't escape. They, they can say it's not, but I think it's, it's ingrained in them a little bit back there. So um, it's definitely a different dynamic this time around, but you know, the athletes at that level are amazing and they're, they're doing the best they can with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, they're human, so they're they're moved by the emotion of the the crowds as well. And um, I, I have been feeling for the athletes this year. Are you watching it with your kids? Are your kids watching it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's it's hard to put them to bed at night because we're usually in the middle of some event, and we're like, oh, it's another late night. Like, <laughs> I just need to go to bed. But we don't want to miss anything either, so it's really hard. But um, yeah, we we watch as much as we can at night, and then as soon as we wake up in the morning, we're watching all the replays for what we missed. And sometimes it's you know the random British people commentate whatever it is. We're just trying to watch the events, and um, it's been really fun. It's been cool seeing the new events like surfing and skateboarding, and I can't wait for the split the speed climbing to come. Like that sounds. Really really cool. So we, yeah, we've been having a lot of fun watching it. Yeah, I, I agree. Do any of your kids have a particular passion in a sport? I mean, do any of them have Olympic aspirations or even just competitive on that level? Not at this point. My oldest did diving for two years. She tried a little gymnastics, um, but she's, she's in a more like dance and, uh, and acting these days, but she, she watches that stuff and she gets that fire. So who knows, maybe she'll find her thing in the next couple of years. Um, my second oldest just wants to be an artist and has zero interest in what's happening at the 
pigs. Um, and my little two, they're still kind of figuring it out. My little one sees Simone. She wants to go try gymnastics. It's Simone's gym. It's right down the street from us. So we're, we'll try that in the fall. And my son's still trying to figure it out, but I know he'll be into something. So he, he thinks the table tennis is really cool right now. He's kind of amazed by the table tennis. So <laughs> it is. It is a, I agree with him. It's pretty phenomenal to watch it. I mean, the, the hand-eye coordination is out of this world. <laughs> yeah. How far back they have to be from the table to hit it. Like I, there's no way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you just marvel at it. It's amazing. And, and how people find their way to these sports and then they end up being just, just extraordinary as you did, obviously. So, you know, you're talking about uh, the Olympics now and, and what's going on in Tokyo. Obviously there was a, a dream and a hope that you would be in Tokyo. You want to share a little bit about the journey that you've had to prepare and plan for that and, and, and where you're sitting now? Yeah. Um, so in 2017, I decided to compete again for the first time in almost a decade. Uh, so I retired to have children after the 2008 Olympic games. And so I came back in 2017 and got second in nationals and was like, all right, let's do this thing. But the path has not been easy. I knew it would be hard anyway, but we, had trouble bringing our daughter home from Ethiopia, our fourth child home from Ethiopia. Um, we finally did, took us a few months to, to settle her in and get her unattached to my neck, you know, it's where I could go back and train again. And then as soon as I did, we found out I had a really bad neck injury and I had to have a two level cervical fusion on my neck, um, which took me an entire year, all of 2019 to recover from and, and work my way back up to 10 meter. So going into 2020, which is when the Olympics were supposed to be, I had just gotten back up on the platform in January, had a couple of competitions under my belt when the entire world shut down. And I thought, you know, as a 42 year old mom before, I was like, sweet, I have an extra year, which sounds so crazy, but I thought this will allow me to fully recover and be stronger and I'll have more time on 10 meter, but we weren't allowed into any facilities because we don't have a, a platform at my pool. We just have a springboard. And so we weren't allowed to in to any facilities until about mid-March of this year. And so again, I only had about if maybe three months um, up on the platform before our Olympic trials. So, you know, I still felt good going into Olympic trials, but I wasn't consistent and it wasn't what I hoped it would be, which, you know, is a little frustrating. You never want to go into that not doing your best, but at the same time, it was a great experience to be in that atmosphere again, to um, kind of be part of the competition and, uh, you know, just really get to know some of the athletes that, that are on the scene and, um, and to be there again, it was really fun. So definitely it was a different flair. It was a little bit like there were barely anybody in the stands. Um, we were worried about a lot of things going into it that we, we weren't going to have our kids sitting together and things like that turned out to be okay. But it was just a really different kind of environment. And, um, you know, that definitely, I think played into my head too. Not that I was totally ready for it, but it wasn't what I was hoping for in a lot of ways, you know, so it's kind of a bummer, but super excited for our divers that are on the team. We've gotten two silver medals so far in the synchronized events. It's been amazing. So cheering on those guys, um, has been incredible. And I hope we hope we have some more great performances. Yeah. Those synchronized divers are just beautiful to watch. Oh, it's just, we were watching them last night as well. And they're just phenomenally beautiful to watch elegant and graceful. And the, the timing is, and, you know, as a trainer, I always think what, what goes into that, you know, to get those perfect, very, very perfect and precise movements and, and get them together that way. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I actually also remember, Laura, when you were back in the pool, because you ended up traveling to Florida at one point to be able to, I don't know if you were competing or training down there where there was a platform um, while we were still working on the book. So you were traveling with the kids, training on, on the dives and, and writing the book all at the same moment, right in the midst of the, the whole pandemic. Yeah, that was actually, we were happy we decided to homeschool because we could do things like that. We took the kids on a road trip down to a meet in Florida in Coral Springs, um, which actually kind of turned into a mini beach vacation for the kids and, and me. You know, it was like a training trip. I got to train, got to be at the beach, got to do work at night. Like it was kind of a good good all around trip for us. Um, and that's kind of, we were just trying to work our way back up because we didn't have access to any other pools at the time for platforms. So I worked my way up to seven meter there. Um, and yeah, it'd be another couple of weeks after that till we got on the 10 meter. Yeah. Amazing. Well, obviously it wasn't meant to be, um, being in Tokyo wasn't, wasn't on your path, but I'm curious what, what's next. I know, um, you've got the book and some things going with that, I'm sure, but 
also a little bit about what are you, what are you doing? Um, you've got a business where you, you get out and help some people too. Share a little bit about what you're doing and what's next here. Um, well, a couple of things. I do have a podcast, The Pursuit of Gold, and I absolutely love that. I have high level athletes, a lot of Olympians on, um, experts, coaches, and really just trying to provide not just inspiration and encouragement to athletes, but resources, tools, tips, tricks, all the things by sharing people's stories and how they got through stuff. Because there's basically no high level athlete that hasn't been through something and learned how to get over it. So I think it's just really fascinating learning from people in all different sports because they're going to have such different stories and journeys and they're going to think outside the box differently. Um, you know, we've had anybody from Apollo Ono, the, you know, legendary speed skater and Bonnie Blair up to, um, Michael Andrew, who is one of the upcoming Olympians, you know, touted to win some medals here in Tokyo. So we've had all kinds of people on. It's been amazing. And I feel like it's been a good resource for me because growing up as an athlete, like I didn't have access to many resources. You know, we didn't have money to spend on that stuff. Um, and I started so late in high school, it wasn't really a thing anyway. But, um, you know, now returning as an athlete, I'm a three time Olympian, but because I wasn't named to a certain squad, I still had zero resources from the US Olympic Committee or anything else. So this has been my way to say, okay, well, if I don't have resources, how can I get them and not just get help for me, but provide it to other people? So, I was like, even if this isn't benefiting anybody else, I'm getting a lot out of it. So hopefully other athletes, uh, even coaches and parents are getting a lot from it too. So that's really kind of my baby right now. I, I love it. It's, it's so much fun and it's so encouraging to me. Um, I do have a course called Confident Competitor where we talk about um, just how to, how to be a great mental athlete, like how to up your game mentally, which will help you up your game physically. Um, we're kind of revamping it a little bit right now, but I'm going to release it again later this year. Um, and, and I love that it's, you know, some of the things people think are so basic, but they don't, they either don't apply them all the time, or they don't know how to apply them. They understand the concept, they don't know how to do it. So we walk you through step by step exactly how to do that. And, and if you do all of those little things, it really makes a big difference in the long run. So do you do that one on one or do you do that with groups? Um, it's an online course. I was doing training with it, but I think when we revamp it, it'll be like a, you walk through it by yourself, but then you can have coaching sessions with me as well if you need them. Fantastic. How do people get find those things? What's your website? Where can they find your podcast? Laura, Laura Wilkinson. Yeah, laurawilkinson.com and you can find the podcast, the course, everything on there. Fantastic. So much more that we can share, but I'm going to let people find your book, read your book and start following you to find out what else is out there and what else they can learn from you. Uh, before we finish, Laura, one of the things I like to ask all of our guess is is about the title of the podcast because I always think it just takes one is a pretty profound idea and I'm always interested and curious about what people think about when they think about it just takes one so I'm curious what, what does that mean to you um I mean I think it's kind of what we were talking about earlier it just takes one person to believe in you you know you can it, it obviously has to start with you and you have to believe in yourself but having one person just say I think you can do that it just frees you on a whole other level. And, and it, it shows you that like, okay, maybe this is possible. And I think it just opened you up in a whole new way. You know, I had that happen with my coach, Kenny, that we talked about um, where he was like, okay, you want to go to the Olympics? This is how we do it. You know, it was like, wait, we can do that. Well, I also had an issue. I, I had just missed making the 1996 Olympic trials. I'm in diving by just the closest margin. It was so, so painful. And the 1992 Olympic champion, Mark Lindsay sat down with me and he goes, look, I know this stinks right now. Like this hurts really bad, but you can use this to be the fuel for your fire for the next four years and come back even stronger. And when an Olympic champion sits down and tells you that you pay attention and that has always stuck with me. So like those, that small, you know, little thing that he told me, it stuck with me and it really was the fuel for the next four years. And I didn't just come back strong. I, I won gold as well. And so that was, I think it just takes one person to really light a fire in someone else. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, and, and I think as the listeners are, are listening to that, I, I always encourage the listeners to think about who they can believe, you know, who they can share that with, who do they believe in, and how can they use their words to share that belief and to encourage somebody and to help somebody achieve whatever that goal is. I think we all have that power within us if we use it and, and recognize it. I love it. Yeah, it's great. Laura, the book is called Life at 10 Meters, Lessons from an Olympic Champion. Where can people find it? 
you can find it on Amazon in paperback or ebook, or you can go to laurawilkinson.com and get an autographed copy. Fabulous. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure working with you. I look forward to watching and following what's next for you and wish you all the best. Thank you, Kelly. You're awesome. Appreciate it.